I'm Pastor Josh. And I'm Pastor Tara. We want to welcome you to our YouTube page and we pray that today you're blessed by everything you experience. And if you are blessed by this sermon, please don't forget to share it with someone in your world. Let's go live to the message. All right, we're going to be having a great time today as we sit under the Word of God and I have an expectation that you will be leaving here filled, strengthened, renewed, ready to go, amen? And if not, if that's not how you came in, that's the way you're gonna leave. The way that the Temple Mount was designed, Solomon's Temple, and actually the Tabernacles was often that there would be different entrances and you were supposed to enter from one direction and leave in the opposite direction. If you came in from the west, you should leave in the east. If you came in from the north, you should leave in the south. Now that's not just for traffic planning, although it is, it's practical, keep moving in one direction. But God wants you to understand that you should never leave the same way you came in. And by that I mean you always leave better off than the way that you came in. And even more so, God always wants you moving forward, not moving backwards. In fact, when God spoke to the design of the temple, the congregation was always to be seated in the east facing the west, because in the western part of the temple was the Holy of Holies. Behind the veil was where the high priest would go and cut covenant between God and man and cover the sin of the nation for the year to come. And God always said, make sure that the entire congregation faces the Holy of Holies. Although we're seated in different patterns today in buildings, actually, technically, what you should be all facing in one direction. And the whole idea behind that is God never wants you looking back. He always wants you looking forward. But in the temple, specifically looking forward to where the Ark of the Covenant is, to where the Holy of Holies is. Why? Because that's where the resting glory of God is. And when you look there, you look there, but you look there knowing the blood of the innocent lamb has gone before you into that presence, behind the veil. And in fact, when Jesus hung at the cross, died and cried out, it is finished, the veil was torn from top to bottom. Top to bottom, how do you tear a piece of paper? Right, you take a piece of paper, I don't have a piece of paper to tear here, I should have brought one up. But you tear it from top to bottom, why? Because that is a sign that it was not torn from the bottom up. The bottom up means people could have gotten involved in it. But for it to be torn from the top down is something supernatural. That is God tearing it. Now, you might think, well, you know, fabric tearing isn't really a big deal. No, the Holy of Holies was a very significant place. And the Holy of Holies was where the resting presence of God was, where the Ark of the Covenant was. And if that presence, that holy presence of God came into contact with an unrighteous man, they would die because the righteousness of God could not compromise with the sinfulness of man. So when God told them to put the ark in the Holy of Holies, he instructed them to put it behind the veil, and the veil was what kept humanity from the glory of God. And when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, he would have to come with the blood of an innocent lamb, of an innocent animal. That's the way he could enter, that's the way he could stand. In fact, he would sprinkle the blood in front of him as he moved. Now the veil was not a thin piece of fabric. In fact, the veil was many inches thick. And they would have to test it before they hung it because should it fall, everyone in the room dies without there being innocent blood that goes before. So the way they would test it is they would tie either side of the veil to a bunch of horses and then slap the horses rear ends, have them charge in opposite directions and it would have to hold up against horses running in the opposite direction as fast as they could. Because if it broke, it was a problem. How many of you know, like if you're, if you're driving, if you're on top of a skyscraper, how many of you know you want that foundation to be solid? You want it to be tested and tried. Well, the veil was tested, and so we know that it was God because they know it could never be torn. In fact, it was their responsibility to ensure that the veil was always in perfect condition. And so when it was torn from top to bottom, it wasn't just that God was saying, I tear the veil. It was saying, now my presence will not kill you no more because the blood of the innocent lamb is on you, over you. Now my righteousness calls you righteous. 
So we're in this place to, today to face the Holy of Holies, but to face it with faith, knowing that He, our hope, has gone ahead of us as our high priest into the perfect, pleasing, precious Holy of Holies with His blood cleansing it once and for all, that we now face eternity with a positive expectation. We don't face eternity with an unknown expectation. We don't face the coming of the Lord with an unknown expectation. No, the resurrected Christ, like Pastor Tara said, is our receipt that sin has been conquered and paid for. Who sinned? Jesus has said, no. He was sinless and blameless. No, he died for your sin. And so today I wanna speak to you from the subject, look forward. Look forward. That's what God tells you to sit in the temple and look forward. And interestingly enough, when the nation of Israel was camped in the wilderness, how many of you know that God gave Moses a specific design? And the design in the wilderness was for their defense. But it didn't make sense to normal armies because the defense mechanism in a wilderness, in a desert place, if you watch any of the old westerns, you would see that they would camp in a circle. They say circle the wagons so that you have a 360 perspective of where all attack can come from. But God told Moses to camp in a different way, and the way in which he instructed them to camp was actually, if you looked from Google Earth, if you looked from space, you would have seen they camped in the shape of a cross. But God told Moses, tell the people to face the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was in the center of the people. They were not told to face outwards from where attack would come. They were told to face inwards to face the temple. And inside the temple, they were told to face the Holy of Holies. God wants you to live your life looking at the temple. Not just the temple, the temple where his sacrifice is present. Where his forgiveness is present, where his favor is present for you, right? And you're not meant to camp looking at the world, you're meant to camp looking at him. And what's interesting is, when a king heard of the nation of Israel and how they were conquering enemies in the wilderness, he decided to set forth the greatest sorcerer to curse them. Because he knew that if this sorcerer curses the nation, they would surely die because everyone this sorcerer would curse died. And when the sorcerer stood on a high place and looked down at the nation of Israel, instead of speaking curses, he pronounces blessing. And the king says to the sorcerer, I brought you here to destroy my enemies. Now you destroy me. Why do you bless them? And the sorcerer says, I cannot bless what, uh, curse what God has blessed. When I see them, I see him. You don't realize what God has done for you in the resurrection of Christ, and I pray today you do. You know, we tell people to have faith, to have faith, to have faith, but often people feel like they're imposters. They feel like they don't deserve it and they haven't earned it. And the interesting thing is, if you think about this today, just say, I use this illustration often, but I love to use it to highlight something because it's exactly how we would all behave. Say you got a text message today on Resurrection Sunday. Dear client, your account has one billion four thousand and fifty rand in it. You'd look at it. You know what I'm saying? Like I know that sometimes in our church life, um, God has been so good, and as we are putting the legacy fund in front of our congregation, our faith is that God would do mighty miracles, right? Now, we've, we've been praying to buy the building in Greenstone for Redemption Church for a long time, and we're busy in the middle of that transaction, and it's a total miracle. The building would cost nearly 200 million to replace today, and we've been able to buy it for over just 40 million rand, but, but God still requires us to raise the finance, right? And we don't push people to give. We don't, there's lie, you know, people say, I remember growing up, people said to me, in Rhema Church, in church, uh, do you guys lock the doors and people are not allowed out until they give? <clears throat> it's a great idea, that, actually. Um, no, 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 no. No, but what's interesting is um, we've been trusting God for giving, and, and sometimes people give large amounts, and when they give large amounts, you count the zeros. Make sure you got it right. 
Is it 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, a million, or even God willing, 10 million, right? You get this notification. And so you count the zeros. Now, if you've got a billion, how many of you know how many zeros that would be? I don't even know. Is it nine or something? I don't know. You see, very good. It's good faith. Hallelujah. So say you got told you had a billion, 4,050. Now, the reason why I say 4,050 is maybe you had 4,050 in your account. Now you get this message that says you have a billion, 4,050. You get this message on Resurrection Sunday. The problem with that is you know what tomorrow is? It's a public holiday. So you can't go into the bank to find out what's going on. Now you spend all of Sunday thinking, my goodness, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? Do I, do I, don't I, do I, do I, don't I? You know, maybe you've walked in the malls and you've walked past the fancy stores your whole life, right? And you've walked past going, they don't even let you in unless you have an appointment. One day I'll go shopping there. One day I'll wear that, I'll have this, right? I don't know what the latest trends are, but, but let's just say, you know, for sake. And then, and then now you know that tomorrow is a public holiday, but the mall is open. <laughs> wow, pastor, I've been wanting to buy those shoes for that 50,000 rand for my whole life. I've been waiting to buy that pair, custom, handmade, Italian leather, right? I, I, I've been wanting that handbag. I've been wanting that watch. You know what I'm trying to say? But now you're wondering, how can I go and buy it? Because I don't know if this money is truly mine. And then you Google, is it illegal to spend money? <laughs> and then you see there that technically it is illegal to spend money that's not yours. But if it's in your account, I mean, come on now. Imagine even if the deposit note said, I love you. A billion rand, I love you. Who loves me? <laughs> then you go out on Monday and you're walking past that mall and you used to shop in the secondhand section. You used to go to the double discount place. Now you're like, oh, I'm going in there. Should I go in there? You go back to the ATM and you take out another, another proof of balance and it's still there, one billion, four thousand. And you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting. Now, you know what you have, but you don't know why you have it. And as long as you don't know why you have it, you don't truly possess it. So here comes Tuesday morning. You get a message. This is the bank. Please come to your local branch. You go to the local branch and the manager says, is that you, Mr. McCauley? Yes, it is. I've been waiting for you. Please come through to my office. You go through all the offices to the office upstairs with the view. Can we get you an espresso, an espresso, <laughs> herbal tea? I don't know, what's a high pH water? You know, can we, can we, and you're wondering what's going on? Well, you're probably wondering why you're here. No, no, I know why I'm here. And they say, yes, it's to do with the billion rand that was deposited in your account. Right? <laughs> See, amen, receive it. And the manager says, you're probably wondering why you have a billion rand, and you're going, I am. And the manager says, well, I don't know if you remember this, but many years ago, you were on a busy high street, and a child ran into traffic, and you ran and grabbed the child and brought it back to its parents and its family. And you're like, yeah, I vaguely remember that. And they say, well, you don't know, but that was a family on holiday in South Africa. And that family, that child is the great grandson of Warren Buffett. And he's been looking for you for years. They finally tracked you down, they confirmed your identity through camera surveillance. And here I have all the forms that Warren Buffett has given you, a billion rand, and he's paid the tax on top of that, that it is yours, that this money is yours. Now, on Sunday, you knew what you had. But on Tuesday, you knew why you have it. Now, all of a sudden, you walk straight to that mall. <laughs> you say to your best friend, you're now my assistant. You phone the mall, you make an appointment for me. <laughs> you phone Rolls Royce, you tell them to have the Phantom ready. I want the Uber driver, I want it going. 
You tell Rolex, shut down the store, I'm coming in for the latest. <laughs> Do you get what I'm trying to say? Louis Vuitton, there's no other customers today. It's just me. The point is that the resurrection is essential for you to recognize that all that Christ has, all that he comes with, all that he possesses, is now yours, rightfully, righteously. See, people think that grace means God went soft on sin. Grace means God punished sin to the uttermost. He poured out his wrath on Christ at the cross to the uttermost. He punished every sin, past, present, and future, to the uttermost. And then it tells us that because Christ was raised from the dead, sin has been conquered, right? And sin's consequence is death. Death does not come first, sin comes first. When sin entered the garden, death came with it. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses three, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope. Everybody say living hope. hope. See, hope dies, right, when the person or the thing that was meant to bring hope is taken away. See, many of you have hope until what you were hoping for appears not to be happening. When it doesn't go according to plan. The Bible does not call it a hope. It calls it a living hope. Christ is your living hope. He is alive. Do you know that he, while he is alive right now, he is working as your high priest. He is working for you. The Bible tells us in heaven, Christ is still doing certain things. One of them is interceding on behalf of the believer. That word for intercession is entenchamo, which has a specific verb, a specific action. In the New Testament in Greek, the word for sin and the noun, I don't mean sin, the act, I mean sin, the noun, meaning all sin. You have types of sin, but it all falls under the category sin, right? That is called hamartia, and it literally means in the Greek to miss the mark. Whether you lust, you lie, you murder, you steal, you doubt, you hate, you miss the mark. You miss God's plan for your life. You miss the best God has for you in the moment. You miss his desire for you, his will for you. So all of sin is called hamartia. And Jesus intercedes on your behalf in the holy of holies, in the heavenly tabernacle. He is praying for you. But he is not praying a stressful, panicked prayer. Oh Lord, not now, not them, not that. He's not praying in heaven like, please help Joshua today. He's beyond help. No, the word there, entenchamo, means to hit the mark. He is praying for you, causing you before the Father to be perfect, pleasing, without sin, to hit the mark. The high priest represents God, represents man to God. A prophet represents man to God. And that's why prophecy is such a powerful office, but it is, its purpose is to edify and build up the body. Whenever someone prophesies doom and gloom, that's not the word of God speaking. They can tell you things like this is ahead, but it's always a redemptive prophecy, but God has gone ahead. This will happen, but God has already made a way, right? The gift of prophecy is to tell you what's wrong and then to tell you, but because of Christ, what's wrong will be made right. It's to always point you to the finished work of Jesus, right? And thank God he's raising biblical prophets, right, who point people to Jesus, who say, yes, you came here, you didn't know, but now God wants you to know he knows everything about you. You know, when Jesus spoke to the woman at the well, he spoke as a prophet. Bring me your husband. Knowing that she doesn't have a husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. He says, you've rightly said you don't have a husband. You actually have had five, and the one you're with now is not your husband. We don't even know if she's divorced from the last husband while she's living with this man. 
Now that prophecy is not to condemn her, it's to say to her, I know all about you, but that's why I'm here. Does that make sense, right? So, so the interesting thing is, Jesus as our high priest, he is functioning on your behalf with God. So he is enter, he is into harming for you. He is making your life beautiful before God. As he prays, he causes you to hit the mark. He also perfects your prayers. Whenever someone was in need, they would come to the high priest and they would bring a sacrifice. And the poorer you were, the less you could afford. In fact, imagine you were lame and poor. What type of sacrifice can you bring? So some people would bring literally a half dead animal to the priest because that's all they could catch. You know, if someone is starving to death and they see an animal that's been hit by a car, they look at that as food, right? Because you're so desperate, you'll take whatever you can get. And they would come to the high priest with a sacrifice that's categorically unqualified. And the high priest would take that sacrifice and then perfect it. And as they would perfect it, they would prepare it that by the time that sacrifice made its way to the altar of judgment, the bronze altar, it would be pleasing to God. So it's your high priest's responsibility right now that he takes what you, even when you pray, God, I don't even know what's gonna happen. That's a prayer of doubt, not faith. By the time it gets to God, it's a sweet smelling prayer. Why I'm telling you this is, it's all to show you that your living hope is working. The Bible says in Hebrews uh, uh, chapter six, verses seven, I think, or seven, verses eight. It's fascinating that it says, our high priest receives our tithes that it testifies he lives. It says, their mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives tithes. Why is it necessary Jesus receives tithes in the Holy of Holies? Whatever it makes its way to the Holy of Holies is blessed. So what that means is your high priest is alive and as you tithe, you are putting your prosperity and your provision in his responsibility so that you can sleep whilst he works. You can rest whilst he prepares the way, right? Your provision is a testimony to those around you who don't know Jesus that he's alive because you earn the same as your coworker, but somehow yours is multiplied, 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 right? So this is your living hope. What is the living hope? Go back to the verse. That he, with his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection. Through the resurrection. See, in the Old Testament, when they would come to worship, they would bring a sacrifice, like I mentioned, to the high priest, and the high priest would take the sacrifice. Now, I'm not talking about the once a year where they would atone for the sins of the nation. I'm talking about on an ongoing basis because people would need to be constantly engaging God, seeking favor, seeking his will, seeking his work over their lives. And whenever they would mess up, they would come. Whenever they needed, uh, even when the nation of Israel needed victory over an enemy, they would come to the high priest and say, prepare a sacrifice, a sweet smelling aroma that we would go into battle and see the Lord win our battle. And so when they came to the high priest, they would bring him a sacrifice and he would take that sacrifice, perfect it, and then bring it up the bronze altar to be burned. Now what's interesting is, David says something interesting. He says when he approaches the tabernacle, he says, it pleases me to see the ashes on the bronze altar. The first thing you would encounter as you came into the tabernacle on your way to worship was the altar of judgment, the bronze altar. Now, if God is unfair and unrighteous and mean, as some people think, the way that often gets taught incorrectly is you better come here with your life correct because the first thing you meet is the judgment of God. No, 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 no. What you don't understand is why would it please David to see the ashes on the bronze altar? Because what an ash means is an ash means that the sacrifice was greater than the sin because the fire did not consume all of it. When God was not pleased with people, do you remember when the prophet called down fire and it, it literally consumed the entire altar? Not just the water, everything was consumed. Nothing left behind. And the enemy fell on their face in fear of the judgment of God. Why? Because God's thirst was not quenched. His wrath was not met. 
When an entire altar is consumed, it means God's not satisfied. But when the fire of God falls upon a sacrifice, consumes it, but leaves behind ashes, it means God's wrath is satisfied. So David would say he loved coming to the tabernacle, to the temple early in the morning. And you know, the first thing the sun's rays hit as the sun raises in the east, the most eastern thing in the tabernacle, which is the first thing, remember I told you, you enter through the east and you move west. The first thing is what? The altar of judgment. So the first thing the sun hits is the altar where the ashes are lying. The first thing God emphasizes is there's ashes, meaning the sacrifice was greater than the sin. Once there are ashes, you can now move more towards the holy of holies. You get to move and engage with God and be accepted into his presence. Ashes in Hebrew, in the Old, in the Old Testament, do you know that word for ashes is actually the word anointing, dashen. You are not anointed because of you, you are anointed because of he who is raised. It is the resurrection power. Now, why am I telling you all of this? Because when they saw the resurrected body of Christ, to every Jew that knew in typology what that meant, it meant that the sins of the world were paid for in full, and the resurrected body means that God's wrath was satisfied. Nobody before had been raised from the dead. And the Bible prophetically said it would only be the Son of God who would be raised from the dead. Only the Son of God would be raised from the dead. And that's why when Jesus was raised from the dead, it is the declaration he is the one, the only, the true Son of God. His resurrection is your receipt that you didn't get what God has for you by dubious means. You didn't get the billion because someone did it by mistake or in an ill-gotten way or someone was trying to launder money. No, he who had it has paid tax for it, has earned it legitimately, is the one who decides to whom he will give it. And it is your living hope that Jesus is alive. It is not a dead hope, it is a living hope, meaning why did people mourn Jesus' death like they did? In fact, in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35, we have an incredible picture where Jesus appears to two people on the road to Emmaus. It says here in verse 13, now behold, two of them were traveling the same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. They talked together all the things which had happened. Now, what are they talking about? The crucifixion and the death of Christ. So it was when they spoke and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near to them. But their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him, meaning he did not let them recognize him. He walks with them and he says, what kind of conversation is this that you're having with one another? Why are you so sad? That word there for sad is depressed. Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered him and said, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? Have you not known the things which has happened in these last few days? And Jesus says to them, what things? They say, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all people and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem us. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things have happened. And yes, the certain woman in our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain those who were with us went to the tomb and found it. And when they said that, they said they didn't see him. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, slow of heart to believe in all the prophets had spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things to enter his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, meaning Jesus took their scripture that they had with them. He took out their scripture and he started with Moses in Genesis and he went through all the prophets. And what does Jesus do? He shows them the things concerning himself meaning it was me who was in the beginning, it was me who has been there all this time, and it is Jesus who is every type and shadow of every victory, of every, every time God conquers the enemy in the Old Testament, it's a picture of Jesus' work, every single time. I don't have time to get into it today, but it is so beautiful. Everywhere you find supernatural victory, it's Jesus. It's a picture of Jesus. It's always Jesus. And then as he walks with them, they start to hear, they start to change. It says in verse 28, they draw near to village <clears throat> where they're going 
And he indicated that he would have gone further, but they constrained him saying, abide with us for it is towards evening, the day is far spent. And he went in to spend, now it came to pass when he sits at the table with him, he takes bread, he blesses it, he breaks it. And their sight is, and, they, and, they, and vanished from their sight and their eyes are opened and they knew him. So he teaches them the things concerning himself, then they break bed, they literally commune together. And then it says their eyes are opened and they knew him. They knew him as Messiah. They came to the revelation, he is the Christ, right? And it's so interesting that they stand up and they literally say to one another, they're like, listen, our hearts were burning whilst he talked with us. Being on fire is a result of reading the word to see it's always been Jesus. It's always been his work. It's always been his way. It's always been him from beginning to end. That's why we say you're alpha and omega. It doesn't mean you've existed all this time. It means you were there in the beginning and you are there at the end. And in the beginning, you gave the law and in the end, you fulfilled it. Right? He doesn't leave it unfulfilled. The resurrection of Christ is the receipt that death has been conquered. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter four, verses 25, Jesus was delivered up because of our sin, but he is raised because of our justification. Meaning you are now righteous. Sin has been paid for in full. In fact, it tells us in Revelation chapter one, verses 18, Jesus says, I am he who lives, was dead and behold, I am alive, the living hope forevermore. And as I am alive, I currently possess the keys of hell and death. Hell and death. This living hope tells you that no matter what you face in the future, he is there with you. He has gone ahead of you. Your moment of death is not, the world doesn't close in and get dark. You don't hear the chanting of demons. You don't have the fear of death. No, he comes to receive you unto himself. So many people I know in their last moments, they glow and they're gone. It's like they get fetched. It says in the blink of an eye, in, a, in an atomic second, you are with him. Can I tell you something? When you're in the presence of God, you have no fear. You are, you are having the time of your life. Why did people weep so much when Jesus died? Because the man who represented God the rabbi who would come to the sick and heal them, to the dead and raise him, to the demon possessed and free them, to the woman with multiple sexual brokenness relationships and restore her with living water, the one who would show up to every mess, every situation, every circumstance, bound by sin, bound by brokenness and set them free. He died. That's why they wept because they thought without him, we have no hope. That's why they were so sad. In Luke chapter 24, we see something fascinating. They come to the tomb of Jesus and they're weeping. Mary is absolutely broken. Why is she weeping? Because the one who walked the earth that would love the unlovable, that would see a prostitute and see the potential of a woman who could worship God like no one else. Right, The one who was amazing, the rabbi who changed everything, the Messiah, the one who loved like no one could love. When he walked into a place, he could still a storm. He could feed the 5,000. We don't have food. What do we have? A few loaves of fish and bread. That'll do. I bless it. Jesus, we don't even know. We don't have money to pay the tax. Catch a fish. Bring it here. That, That Jesus was dead, and that's why they wept. And that's why they wept. And when she came to the tomb, it's so fascinating. In verse five, they were afraid. They bow their heads because they actually see angels. And you know what the angels say to them in verse five? Why do you seek the living among the dead? Oh. The world always wants you to seek the living among the dead. Look for hope in an economy. Look for purpose in another person. Look for identity in what people say and how you feel. But the truth is, you can only find the life, the resurrection power, the identity God has for you, the purpose God has for you, the plan God has for you in Christ. 
You do not need to seek a future in the world. Your future is in Him. I know the plans I have for you, the future I have for you, the plans of hope, the plans of a future, the good plans I have made for you. We do not need to be seeking the living among the dead, right? He is not here, the next verse says, but is risen. He is alive and risen. And as the risen Christ, the first things he does are amazing. The first person he calls for by name is Peter, the disciple who failed him the greatest, the disciple who denied him three times in an earshot of Jesus. Whilst Jesus is getting tortured, tormented, mocked, and abused, Peter is there within a few meters of him. The place in which Peter denies Christ is small. It's not a room like this. It's a small place, just a few square meters in size. Only a handful of people could have been there. You notice how the two on the road to Emmaus were down and depressed because they said, our chief priests and elders crucified him. It's not true that the crowd of people in Jerusalem crucified Jesus. In fact, they planned it in such a way that was absolutely prophetic because it's the complete fulfillment of the Passover lamb. But the actual strategy was if we kill him just after Passover, the nation will be hung over and full because when they would eat of Passover, they would drink wine and they would eat of lamb. No matter how poor the household, every household got wine and lamb. If it was the only time the entire year they got to eat meat and drink wine, they would do it at Passover and they would do it well. So the next day, people are sleeping late. And by the time the city is awake, he's already on the cross. So it was just a small room full of chief priests and elders, a handful of people calling and a handful of leaders. And a hand, it wasn't this massive crowd. The massive crowd celebrated him coming on Palm Sunday because they knew here comes the one who does for us what no rabbi would do. Here's the one who takes away our sin, the one who actually deals with death, the one who actually heals the sick. Here's the answer. They were celebrating Jesus was in town. But as they're calling for him to be crucified, they're mocking him, they're torturing him. Peter is right there. A few hours earlier, he's the one saying to Jesus, if everybody else runs, I'll be the one to stand by you. Boasting in his own ability. Boasting in his own strength. And Jesus says, now that you boast in your own strength, I have to show you how good your own strength is. Not only will you not be near me, you will betray me and you will deny me three times. You will actually go from a, a believer to an unbeliever three times. Why three times? Because in that time, if you were married, you were in covenant, right? There's only two types of covenant to the Jew, the covenant they have with God through Abraham, right? And the covenant they have with their spouse. And the way you break covenant is you say to your spouse three times, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. On the third time, it is legally binding. You are no longer married, you cut covenant. So Jesus says, you will deny me three times. You will go from a believer to a categoric unbeliever. Judas betrayed Jesus, which was bad, but according to the law, what Peter did was far worse. And who is the first name the resurrected Christ calls for by name? He says, go call the disciples and Peter. Why does he mention him by name? Because he knew if he told them, go call the disciples, they would have gone not to Peter. And if Peter happened to be around, he would have already said, I'm no longer a disciple. I'm categorically, an, I am no longer a follower of Christ. He's no longer my rabbi. I've broken covenant with him. And she would have said, we know that, but he called for you by name. Why is he able to call the first person by name is the one who sinned the greatest? Because now he has paid for that sin of the one who denies him. The resurrection power says, I call you, son, to follow me. I call you back to the fold. In fact, the prophecy I spoke of you, Peter, that you would be a little rock in this church and you would be a part of the leadership never changed never changed because now I've paid for every fallen mistake and mess that you could ever be and will ever be. And if you would receive this work for you, you will walk in resurrection power. 
The resurrected Christ does specific things. He appears to the two on the road to Emmaus and he shows them the things concerning himself. The Bible says there's two people on the road to Emmaus, one whose name was Cleopas, right? Why does the Bible only mention one person's name, right? Now, it is the biblical opinion of many, many, many theologians, which I share, that the reason why it mentions one name is because one name covered both. When Tara and I got married, we were announced into the room, introducing to you Mr. and Mrs. Joshua McCauley. She went from Tara Lee Stewart to Tara Lee McCauley. So if the Bible wants to highlight two people engaging with Christ by name, he just has to say he appeared to the McCauleys. So it's widely believed that this is Mr. and Mrs. Cleopas. Why would Jesus appear to two who are depressed, leaving, sad and broken? Why, because it all went wrong with the couple in the garden. And the couple in the garden ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that knowledge told them you are not good because they're not good by works, they were good by God. They ate of the understanding of what is good and what is evil, and that condemned them. And Jesus comes with the meal of communion that says, your body is healed because his was broken. Your blood is now righteous because his blood was shed for you. And after they hear of the word and they eat as a couple, they eat righteousness and salvation unto them. See, everything is a pattern and an order. Now, wow. Wow. How awesome. Jesus doesn't do random things, everybody. He restored a couple. The first people saved in the New Testament is a couple redeemed by eating of the knowledge of Jesus. Right? Amen? And last but not least, what is the first word spoken to his disciples? They're gathered in fear. I mean, just a few days earlier, they're gathered in faith. Now they're gathered in fear because Jesus has died. Even though he said, I would die and rise again. Even though he said, it's necessary that I go. They are gathered in fear. Why are they scared? Because they think if they killed him, they're coming for us next. Which wasn't untrue, but they had the power of God on their side, right? So they're gathered in fear and Jesus appears in fear. Do you know fear is a sin? According to scripture. We don't like to talk about that. We judge everyone else's sins, but we don't want ours to be exposed, right? You know, you can gossip all day and night, but you be like, I don't drink alcohol. You know what I'm trying to say? Self-righteousness always points everybody else's issues out, right? But here's the thing, fear is a sin. So they are gathered in sin. And the Bible tells us the resurrected Christ appears in their midst, in the middle of their sin. He appears, and one of his first words the resurrected Christ to his disciples. His first words is as he shows them his hands where his wounds are, he says, peace. Now, he doesn't mean peace like, hey, everything, let's be at peace. <laughs> he uses a specific word, shalom. And you know that before he went at the Passover meal, before he went to the cross, he says, my peace you will inherit. I bequeath it through my will. Through my death, you will inherit my peace. The peace that sleeps in a storm. The peace that says, don't worry, I'll get to Lazarus when the time is right. The peace that says, don't worry, this food will feed 50,000. You know what I'm trying to say? 20,000. Uh, don't worry, th this fish will pay the tax. Relax. Everything's cool. Everything's chilled. Everything's fine. Jesus never ran and panicked and stressed, right? And he says, peace, as he shows them his wounds. Shalom. The first words out of Christ are because, see, why does Jesus keep the wounds in his resurrected body? Because it's the receipt of the payment. By his stripes, we are healed. By his blood. The Bible says in Romans chapter eight that nothing separates us from the love of God, right? It even lists angels and demons. What does that mean? Even if the most holy angel comes and says, God, I can't deal with this Joshua anymore. It's enough. He's driving us crazy. 
He doesn't have enough faith. He doesn't have enough wisdom. He doesn't function with you, Lord. He is not worthy of the call of God on his life. God the Father looks to his right hand and he sees Jesus with the wounds on his hands and his feet and his side and his head. And he says, angel, because of this sacrifice, these ashes, because of this body that remains on the other side of my wrath, my righteousness is now on the side of my son, Joshua, and you can never get between me and the love and the favor and the blessing I have for my son. That's your Jesus. And one last thing, in Hebrews chapter nine, verses 24, it tells us, for Christ did not enter the holy place made with hands, meaning the earthly temple, which are a copy of the true heaven itself, but he went into heaven itself to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year, meaning here the high priest is going in every year with the blood of other bulls and goats, but Jesus enters once, right? He suffers once since the foundation of the world, but now once at the end of the ages, he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. Now this will encourage you, listen to this. You know Jesus is coming again, and you know people think and they say to you, if you're a Christian, if you believe in Jesus, they say you better make sure you're not in a movie, you better make sure you're not, you're not sinning, you better make sure because if he comes, you could miss it. If he comes, you could not catch the boat. If he comes, if you have still in, sin in your life, you'll be left behind, right? That's not true. The Bible says that he went into heaven and he offered up his sacrifice for sin once because it was a payment for all sin. See, the high priests locally used to have to sacrifice for the sin of the year to come, but it was never enough for the sin of all because it was not the lamb. It was a picture of the lamb, but it was not the substance. When Christ died for us, he went into the heavenlies and he paid for sin once and for all. He took his blood up there once and for all. But here's the most amazing thing. Now that his blood has paid for your sin, if you believe Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, meaning you have prayed and you believe and you receive, when Jesus comes again, it says here, he will appear a second time apart from sin, but for salvation. It says there in the Hebrew, he will appear a second time, having dealt with sin once and for all, he comes a second time just to collect you, just to get you, no matter where you are, right? I see people in airplanes, some are sleeping, some are stressing, some are watching movies, some are chewing chewing gum, some are even with their eyes open. I said to one person, why are your eyes open and, and you're holding the seat? They said, I'm keeping the plane up with my mind. Everyone in that airplane gets to that destination. Why don't you just rest and relax and enjoy the flight? When Jesus comes again, the church, everyone who said Jesus is my Lord and Savior, He doesn't come to judge your sin. Your sin has been judged. He just returns to gather you and collect you. Even the future rapture of the church, we shouldn't fear. Whether you're playing golf, watching a movie, even in a bad place, maybe even losing your temper, you just get to see He comes for your salvation. Even our future is secure as the church. Here appear a second time, but it's a glorious coming. It's a wonderful coming. It's like, wow, my goodness, how awesome. How awesome is this, right? We don't need to fear. No, 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 no. We know that we have the love of God and perfect love casts out all fear. Right, And the Bible tells us in 1 John 4, 17, love has been perfected among us in this, that we have boldness in the day of judgment because as He is, so are we in this world. Not so are we in heaven, so are we right now. As He is healed and whole, forgiven, conquering death, conquering sin, we can have boldness in a day of judgment because the judgment is not for the believer. The believer has already been judged in Jesus. 
right? So now it is no longer judgment against you. It is judgment on your side. Even if you were to die before Christ returns, you do not appear before Jesus in a judgment seat that judges your sin. When it tells us we appear before the great throne of judgment where Jesus sits, it is called the Bema seat. The reason why Paul calls it the Bema seat is because at the time of Paul writing it, there is a seat of judgment, but it has nothing to do with the court of law. It is the place where you go to play sport, to do the Olympics. And the Bema seat is where they would hand out a reward based on how people participated. But there was never a situation for people who ran in a 100 meter race and the person in the judgment seat says, whoever came last, send them to death. No, it was, you came first, you came second, you came third, you came fourth, you came fifth, you came sixth, here's your reward, here's your reward, here's your reward. But it's not a judgment of sin because you have been judged in Christ for your sin. When you get to heaven, if Christ is there, which He is, you are already deemed righteous. Right? God doesn't look at you and show you your sin because the Bible says He has forgotten and removed all of your sin. So you stand in heaven before the resurrected Christ and you receive your reward. If you are unsecure in your salvation, then Christ is unsecure in His resurrection. That's why it's called a living hope. When the devil comes and says to you, what about tomorrow? You say, well, Jesus is there tomorrow. What about your provision tomorrow? Well, my high priest is there tomorrow. What about the mistakes I make tomorrow? Well, his blood is there in my tomorrow. Well, what about in eternity? Well, Jesus is in eternity. And as he is, so am I in this world, this country, this economy, this setting, this circumstance. You are in Christ. You can do all things through the resurrection power that is in you today. Amen. I want to Thanks so much for joining us today and we trust that you were blessed. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to our page and maybe share this word with someone else. Or even better, join us in person at one of our churches yes. one day. Until then, be blessed. Yes.